A huge warship disappeared along with its crew during World War II and suddenly reappeared 70 years later. An elegant black Cadillac pulls up to the grounds of a secret research center in Philadelphia. A respectable businesswoman named Catherine Moore emerges from the car and two smiling employees are already waiting for her. The head of the institution, Richard Faulkner, orders his assistant named Reese to park the car of the long-awaited guest. Miss Moore gets right to the point and asks him directly if the device Richard designed works. He replies th that his invention will probably change the tactics of warfare in the 21st century. They enter the facility, and an assistant reports that everything is ready to begin the experiment. Through the armored glass, Richard and Catherine watch as her black Cadillac drives into the room. She looks at Richard with surprise, but he calms her down, since it is only a company car. The employees gradually increase the power of the electric current, and the car slowly evaporates. After a while, the car returns to its place, and the impressed Catherine agrees that it wasn't bad. Richard wittily points out that the word not bad is to praise the inventors of superglue, and they invented invisibility. At this point, something goes wrong, and an unknown voice comes over the radio. Meanwhile, a small light engine plane is getting ready on the runway, 19 kilometers from Philadelphia. The pilot requests permission, gains acceleration, but suddenly notices strange electrical discharges ahead of him. During takeoff, a mysterious warship suddenly appears in his path, and the plane smashes to pieces. At the same time, the Cadillac at the research center disappears again, and the bewildered Richard tries to pretend that it was intentional. At that moment, a barista and hacker named Molly Gardner helps cafe owner Lena bypass the loan payment schedule. Right then, the young local sheriff, Carl Reed, walks into the cafe, and habitually asks Molly again if she will marry him today. Their playful conversation is suddenly interrupted by a call on the radio. The dispatcher tells Carl that he is urgently needed at the Broadmar airfield, where there has been a strange explosion. According to him, some kind of ship has appeared right there on the runway. Surprised, Carl apologizes and says he has to go. Molly wishes him luck, and promises to think about the offer. Meanwhile, Catherine wonders how Richard managed to pull it off after all. He replies that the technology was developed back in 1943, but now he has no intention of sharing the glory and is planning to obtain his patent. Suddenly an assistant catches up with them and tells them that they found out where that mysterious voice was coming from. It came from the old American destroyer Eldridge. In the meantime, Carl arrives at the airfield, where a local worker shows him the very same ship. The guy can't believe his eyes. The man tells him that the thing just appeared out of nowhere. The shocked cop asks for support from the National Guard and Marines, because they have a World War II destroyer right there. Meanwhile, the atmosphere aboard the ship itself is grim. The soldier asleep at his desk suddenly wakes up, finds his broken glasses, and tries to contact a man named Salinger to inform him of the breakdown of the phase generator. Suddenly he notices that his boots seem to have fused with the floor. The sailor barely gets his feet out of his shoes, and sets out to find out what is going on. When he reaches the communications room, he tries to call the rest of the crew, but no one hears him. As he continues down the corridor, the guy is horrified to see the petrified parts of his dead colleagues, which are frozen like statues in the metal walls of the ship, like his shoes. While flying aboard a private jet, Richard says that the USS Eldridge has been decommissioned after an experiment. Catherine has also heard something about this. Eldridge and his crew disappeared in 1943, never coming out of disguise. Meanwhile, Carl excitedly tells Molly over the phone that the same Eldridge really did appear out of nowhere on the runway. Their conversation is interrupted by a voice coming from the ship, and Carl rushes to his rescue. Meanwhile, the sailor on board approaches a bright glow, which abruptly sucks him in and throws him out. Carl, on the other hand, notices a glow on the outside of the hull, and after touching it, finds himself inside the ship. Immediately afterwards, Molly arrives at the scene and is also shocked for a while by what she has seen. A local worker tells her that the young man is on the ship. Suddenly the ship becomes electrified, and Carl tries to communicate with someone on the radio. At this point, the destroyer lights up brightly and disappears again, taking with it the poor old worker who had gotten too close. Molly, on the other hand, tries to call for help in tears. In turn, the miraculously surviving sailor finds himself transported from a World War II ship straight into the center of a modern city. Unusual cars with rumbling music, 
strangely dressed tattooed people with incomprehensible devices in their hands and ears, and huge monitors in store windows, confuse the man. Suddenly he finds something familiar called a telephone booth, and tries to contact someone. After that, with an astonished look, he notices a newspaper front page, which states in large print that the day is Monday, August 27, 2012. Next, the sailor walks into Lena's very same coffee shop, and orders a cup of joe, the old-fashioned name for coffee. Lena asks about lattes, espressos, americanos, but the man still insists on a regular Joe. The surprised Lena serves him, and the sailor asks how he can get in touch with the Navy. The woman replies that one simply has to go to their website. The bewildered man tries to pretend to understand, and asks if he is in Springview, Pennsylvania. He clarifies that he is not lost, but just hasn't been here in a while. Afterwards, the sailor asks if she knows Mary Gardner. Lena replies that there is a Molly Gardner working there, but she has the day off. The man immediately pays with an obsolete bill, and leaves in a hurry. Lena immediately calls Molly, and tells her that a strange man in a military uniform was looking for her grandmother. Meanwhile, the staff contacts Faulkner and tells him that the generators are still running and there has been a sudden power surge. At this point, somewhere in a back alley, the sailor becomes ill and his body becomes electrocuted. At the same time, bright electric flashes also appear in the sky above downtown Chicago, and unsuspecting passers-by are horrified to see the huge military destroyer plummet to the roof of a skyscraper and simply become stuck on top of it. Huge pieces of shrapnel fly off the building, and people scatter in panic. Sheriff Carl, who is missing on board, suddenly regains consciousness and sees that his hand is strangely stuck in the wall of the ship. He tries unsuccessfully to get it out. Meanwhile aboard the plane, Catherine reports that Eldridge has been spotted again, and she orders the pilot to change course for Chicago. In the meantime, Molly heads to her grandmother's house, where she suddenly discovers the same surviving sailor. He calms the shocked girl down and explains that he is her grandfather, Bill Gardner. Bill immediately wonders where her mother Emmy is. Molly replies that her mother died three years ago. As for her grandmother, she passed away when Molly was a child. Before she died, her grandmother had spent her whole life looking for Bill, because it had been 70 years since he went missing. Molly asks her grandfather to explain what is going on and how he got here. Bill tells her that something went wrong with a certain device aboard the Eldridge, and now he urgently needs to get in touch with someone who can help sort things out. That's when Lena calls and asks her to turn on the TV, which is just talking about a warship that has landed on the roof of a skyscraper. Catherine and Richard finally arrive at the scene. Richard explains that back in 1943, the Eldridge crew used a phase generator that was overloaded and caused the ship to disappear. At the time the Navy thought it had exploded, but they were wrong, because the ship created such a powerful energy field that it caused gravitational fluctuations. That is, a rift in time and space into which Eldridge fell. While 70 years had passed since then, it was a blink of an eye for the ship. Picking up information on the internet, Molly tells her grandfather that the Navy closed the case after the war and the technology was sold to the Grey Guard, the government's most powerful weapons and security systems company. Meanwhile, Catherine and Richard receive information about the survivor from Eldridge, named William Gardner, the chief technician on Salinger's team. While Molly searches for a more modern outfit for her young grandfather, he wonders where she got the men's clothes from at home. The girl explains that morals have changed a bit since the 40s, especially since she is already practically engaged to Carl. At that moment, a U.S. government agent unexpectedly visits their home. At the same time, someone calls Molly on the phone and warns her of the danger. According to the caller, she needs to bring Bill to the 6th Avenue telephone and he will contact them. Molly lets the stranger into the house and then asks which department he is from. The stranger notes that people never look at the badge, and it is very frivolous of them. Then he directly asks Molly where Bill Gardner is, at which point Bill attacks him from behind. As a result of a serious scuffle, Bill overpowers his opponent with Molly's help. Meanwhile, Catherine orders an assault team to infiltrate the ship, and Richard tries to explain to her that this is a problem for the scientists, not for the special forces. In turn, Molly and Bill sneak into Lena's cafe and ask to borrow her car and some money. While the special forces prepare to storm the ship, Richard's assistant Reese reports that the phase generator is working even more intensively, meaning that the object may move again. And if last time it looked like just a little fireworks, this time it's going to be full-fledged explosion. Richard asks Catherine to call off the group because they might all be killed. Molly and Bill manage to make it to the telephone booth, but at that moment, he has the usual seizure. Meanwhile, 
the agent breaks into Lena's cafe, and at gunpoint, tries to find out where Bill and Molly Gardner are. Catherine orders the special forces to cut the hull of the ship, but suddenly there is a bright flash that sucks them all inside. While Bill is squirming from the seizure outside the phone booth, Molly learns the code phrase, Elephant Gate, from the person she is talking to. She tries to help Bill, but he pushes her away, emitting a powerful discharge. Meanwhile, aboard the ship, Carl is still unable to free his hand, but manages to reach for the phone to contact Molly. At that moment, a powerful electrical wave engulfs the ship, and it evaporates again. While on the road, Molly notices a missed call from Carl, which means he is still alive. Bill advises her to hurry so that he stays alive. When asked where they are going, Bill replies that they are going to Morton Salinger's. Molly assures them that this is impossible, for he has been dead for a long time. Richard and Catherine wonder where and when the Eldridge will reappear. She says that she intends to destroy the ill-fated ship. Richard strongly advises against bombing the massive electromagnetic field, because any explosion will amplify it tenfold. But Catherine insists that the ship is very dangerous and must be destroyed. Then Richard asks his assistant Reese to disconnect the ship from the generator by any means necessary. Meanwhile, Molly and Bill arrive at the river pier, where they find his old chief Morton. Morton tells Bill that back in the 40s he realized the power of this technology and decided to take it to his grave with him. But 20 years ago, Grey Guard decided to restart the project and tried to hire him. And since it was not advisable to refuse these people, he decided to fake his own death. The restless agent Hagen reports to Catherine that it turns out Morton Salinger is alive. His voice was identified during the transmission of a code message called Elephant Gate. Catherine orders him to find all of these people, preferably alive, but dead will do just as well. Richard strongly advises against killing the people who invented the device. But Catherine assures him that if Salinger had wanted to be useful to them, he would have done so long ago. Morton tells Bill that his seizures are caused by his atoms bonding with the ship due to prolonged proximity. In turn, Molly inquires about the possible fate of her boyfriend, who is now on the ship. Morton replies that his chances of survival are extremely slim. Meanwhile, during a failed attempt to disable the generator, Reese and several other scientists of the research center perish. Morton tells him that it is very important to get Bill back aboard the ship, because the quantum connection between the two generators can only be broken at the point of origin. That is, only Bill can disarm the Eldridge. Suddenly Hagen catches up with them, and a spectacular chase with explosions and gunfire ensues. Bill goes hard on the gas, and Morton says he has a booby trap hidden nearby. At the last moment, Morton activates a laser tripwire that blows up the pursuers. The enemy car explodes, but Hagen manages to jump out of it beforehand. Suddenly Molly and Bill notice that Morton is badly hurt. They stop and see that he is bleeding. Before he dies, the old man asks Bill to make sure he gets on the ship and goes back to 1943 with it. To do so, they need to track down his small science team. Watching the video of Bill's seizure, Richard figures out that he is the key to solving the problem because he falls into the same phase as the ship. And if they are with Morton now, he has a hunch as to where they are going. Richard asks his assistant not to tell Catherine and rushes to the airport. Meanwhile, Hagen finds the dying Morton and without obtaining any information, puts a bullet in his head. While Bill and Molly try to get around a roadblock on the highway unnoticed, Catherine sends fighter jets to the spot where the Eldridge may have appeared. During the check, Bill, hiding behind the car, has another seizure, which draws the attention of the cops. At this point, the ship appears in the middle of the desert, and the fighter jets immediately approach. In turn, Bill unleashes a high-powered discharge, the force of which ignites one of the cars. The resulting panic distracts the cops, and Bill and Molly manage to hide in a van that's driving away. The fighter jets start bombing the Eldridge, but it is protected by a powerful force field. They try to get close to it, but things don't go according to plan. Furious, Catherine tries to contact the pilots but to no avail. Meanwhile, the ship suddenly appears in England, right on top of the reactor of a nuclear power plant. Bill and Molly arrive at the Salinger Research Center and find that all of his employees are already dead. Molly manages to retrieve one of the laptops, but the assassins start chasing them. They finally surround them and try to shoot Bill, but it turns out he has his own protective field. All of their attempts to break through Bill's defenses not only reinforce it, but also give him a chance to respond with lethal discharges. Just before Bill is able to deal with everyone, Richard pulls up behind them. On the way, Bill explains that he is obliged to return to the past together with the ship, and Molly will help them figure out how to do all this, since she has stolen the notebook with Salinger's research. Meanwhile, 
Catherine learns that Richard has concealed his plans from her, and with the help of threats, forces his assistant to disclose everything. Richard, Bill and Molly arrive at the research center and, after figuring out the new schematics, decide not to go looking for the ship in England, but simply to bring the ship back. During the procedure, Bill has another seizure, but they still manage to get the Eldridge back to the center. Bill is immediately sent aboard, and Catherine and her agents burst in. Hagen immediately goes looking for Bill, and Catherine is about to destroy everyone along with the Eldridge and the Science Center. Richard tries to explain that the ship must be brought back, or the consequences could be irreversible for the entire planet. Catherine declares that the President himself has ordered a tactical nuclear strike on the site. During the ensuing confrontation, she wounds Richard with a gun on board, Bill finds Carl and uses his power to successfully free his hand. Bill is then immediately attacked by Hagen, and a fight ensues between them. Meanwhile, Catherine's team finishes the final preparations to destroy the center, but Molly manages to take out Catherine. Richard asks Molly to run away with Carl, while he stays behind to keep all secrets with him. Meanwhile, Carl comes to Bill's rescue, but he has another seizure, which he uses to deal with Hagen. In the meantime, a nuclear bomber approaches them. Carl exits the ship, leaving Bill behind. Just then, a huge vortex forms in the sky above the center, sucking everything into it, including the center itself, the ship, and even the bomber that managed to get close enough. Carl and Molly manage to leave the center at the last minute. In the last scene, Molly returns home to be greeted in the kitchen by her aging Grandpa Bill. Hey, Grandpa. Oh, hi, honey. Like and subscribe to watch more videos like this, and don't forget to turn on your notification. That really helps my channel. Thanks for watching.